Chapter Twenty Two of the Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two. Mr. Sheehan speaks. Joe helped to carry what was mortal of Eskew from Ariel's house to its final abiding place. With him in that task were Buckaloo, Bradbury, the Colonel, and the grandsons of the two latter and mrs louden drew in her skirts grimly as her stepson passed her in the mournful procession through the hall her eyes were red with weeping not for eskew but not so red as those of mamie pike who stood beside her on the way to the cemetery joe and ariel were together in a carriage with buckaloo and the minister who had read the service a dark pleasant-eyed young man and the squire after being almost overcome during the ceremony experienced a natural reaction talking cheerfully throughout the long drive he recounted many anecdotes of eskew chuckling over most of them though filled with wonder by a coincidence which he and flitcroft had discovered the colonel had recently been made the custodian of his old friend's will and it had been opened the day before the funeral eskew had left everything he possessed with the regret that it was so little to joe but the queer thing about it said the squire addressing himself to ariel was the date of it the seventeenth of june the colonel and i got to talking it over out on his porch last night trying to recollect what was going on about then and we figured it out that it was the monday after you come back the very day he got so upset when he saw you going up to Loudon's law office with your roses. Joe looked quickly at Ariel. She did not meet his glance, but, turning instead to Ladieu, the clergyman, began, with a barely perceptible blush, to talk of something he had said in a sermon two weeks ago. The two fell into a thoughtful and amiable discussion, during which there stole into Joe's heart a strange and unreasonable pain the young minister had lived in canaan only a few months and joe had never seen him until that morning but he liked the short honest talk he had made liked his cadenceless voice and keen dark face and recalling what he had heard martin pike vociferating in his brougham one sunday perceived that Ladham was the fellow who had got to go because his sermons did not please the judge yet ariel remembered for more than a fortnight a passage from one of these sermons and as joe looked at the manly and intelligent face opposite him it did not seem strange that she should he resolutely turned his eyes to the open window and saw that they had entered the cemetery were near the green knoll where eskew was to lie beside a brother who had died long ago he let the minister help ariel out going quickly forward himself with buckaloo and then after the little while that the restoration of dust to dust mercifully needs he returned to the carriage only to get his hat ariel and ladieu and the squire were already seated and waiting aren't you going to ride home with us she asked surprised no he explained not looking at her i have to talk to norbert flitcroft i'm going back with him good-bye his excuse was the mere truth his conversation with norbert in the carriage which they managed to secure to themselves continuing earnestly until joe spoke to the driver and alighted at a corner near mr farbach's italian possessions don't forget he said as he closed the carriage door i've got to have both ends of the string in my hands forget norbert looked at the cupola of the pike mansion rising above the maples down the street it isn't likely i'll forget when joe entered the lewis quince room which some decorator drunk with power had mingled into the brewer's villa he found the owner and mr sheehan with five other men engaged in a meritorious attempt to tone down the apartment with smoke two of the five others were prosperous owners of saloons two were known to the public whose notion of what it meant when it used the term was something of the vaguest as politicians the fifth was mr farbach's closest friend one who joe had heard was to be the next chairman of the city committee of the party 
they were seated about a table enveloped in blue clouds and hushed to a grave and pertinent silence which clarified immediately their circumstance that whatever debate had preceded his arrival it was now settled their greeting of him however though exceedingly quiet indicated a certain expectancy as he accepted the chair which had been left for him at the head of the table he looked thinner and paler than usual which is saying a great deal but presently finding that the fateful hush which his entrance had broken was immediately resumed a twinkle came into his eye one of his eyebrows went up and a corner of his mouth went down well gentlemen he said the smokers continued to smoke and to do nothing else the exception being mr sheehan who though he spoke not exhibited tokens of agitation and excitement which he curbed with difficulty shifting about in his chair gnawing his cigar crossing and uncrossing his knees rubbing and slapping his hands together clearing his throat with violence his eyes fixed all the while as were those of his companions upon mr farbach so that joe was given to perceive that it had been agreed that the brewer should be the spokesman mr farbach was deliberate that was all which added to the effect of what he finally did say joe he remarked placidly you are the next mayor of canaan why do you say that asked the young man sharply because us here he answered interlocking the tips of his fingers over his waistcoat that being as near folding his hands as lay within his power because us here shall try to fix it so and so hath decided joe took a deep breath why do you want me dot replied the brewer is something i shall tell you he paused to contemplate his cigar we want you because you are the best man for the position louis you mustn't make a mistake at the beginning joe said hurriedly i may not be the kind of man you're looking for if i went in he hesitated stammering it seems an ungrateful thing to say but but there wouldn't be any slackness i couldn't be bound to anybody hold up your horses mr farbach once in his life was so ready to reply that he was able to interrupt who oh, have you heard speak of bounding have i speak of favors did i say that should be slackness in the city government listen to me joe he renewed his contemplation of his cigar then proceeded i have been thinking to offer now a couple of years i have made up my mind if some peoples are government to keep the laws and others are not that's a great advantage of the orders this is what is ruining the country and the peoples is commencement to take notice everywheres in other towns is this housekeeping they are reforming and indicting when pretty soon the movement comes here sure if we intend to hold a party in power we shall be a little ahead of the movement so when it should be here we have a good administration to fall back on now there is another brewery open on trying to compete with me here in canaan if that brewery owners is mayor all the saloons buying me beer must shut up at eleven o'clock on sundays but the others keep open if i own the mayor i make the same against the other brewery now i'm pretty sick of the ways of business when fighting all times also mr farbach added with magnificent calmness my trade is largely all outside of canaan when it's better that here the laws shall be enforced the same for all listen joe all of us here believes the same way you are square the whole saloon element knows that one knows that all will be treated the same mid you it would be fairness for each one foolish peoples have said you are a law tricker but we know that you have only made the laws protect as well as punish when at such times as they have been broken you have made them as merciful as you could you're no tricker we're willing to help you make it clean town otherwise the fightin will go on until the movement strikes here when all the cranks wake up and we get a fool reformer for mayor when the town goes to the dogs 
if I try to put in a man that I own, the other brewery is going to fight like hell. But if I work for you, it will not fight so hard. But the other people, Joe objected, those outside of what is called the saloon element, do you understand how many of them will be against me? It is the saloon element, Mr. Farbach returned peacefully, that does the fighting. And you have considered my standing with that part of Canaan which considers itself the most respectable section? He rose to his feet standing straight and quiet facing the table upon which it chanced there lay a copy of the tocsin one yet observed mr farbach with mildness we've got some pretty respectable people right here except me broke in mr sheehan grimly you have have you thought of this joe leaned forward and touched the paper upon the table we have replied mr farbach all of us you shall beat it there was a strong course of confirmation from the others and joe's eyes flashed have you considered he continued rapidly while a warm color began to conquer his pallor have you considered the powerful influence which will be against me and more against me now i should tell you than ever before that influence i mean which is striving so hard to discredit me that lynch law has been hinted for poor fear if i should clear him have you thought of that have you thought have we thought of martin pike exclaimed mr sheehan springing to his feet face aflame and beard bristling ay we thought of martin pike and our thinking of him is where he begins to get what's coming to him what do you stand there picking straws for what's the matter with you he demanded angrily his violence tenfold increased by the long repression he had put upon himself during the brewer's deliberate utterances if louis farbach and his crowd say they're for you i guess you've got a chance haven't you wait said joe i think you underestimate pike's influence underestimate the devil shouted mr sheehan uncontrollably excited you talk about influence he's been the worst influence this town's ever had and his tracks covered up in the dark wherever he set his ugly foot down these men know it and you know it some but not the worst of it because none of ye live as deep down in it as i do you want to make a clean town of it you want to make a little heaven of the beach and in the eyes of judge pike joe cut him off and all who take their opinions from him i represent beaver beach mike sheehan gave a wild shout hurroo it's come i knowed it would the day i couldn't hold my tongue though i passed my word i would when the coward showed the deed he didn't dare to get recorded wall he shouted again with bitter laughter ye do in the eyes of them as follow martin pike you stand for the beach and all its wickedness do ye hurroo it's come you're an offence in the eyes of martin pike and all his kind because you stand for the beach are you you know it joe answered sharply if they could wipe the beach off the map and me with it martin pike would shouted mr sheehan while the others open-mouthed stared at him martin pike would i don't need to tell you that said joe mr sheehan's big fist rose high over the table and descended crashing upon it it's a damn lie he roared martin pike owns beaver beach End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of the Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Joe Walks Across the Courthouse Yard From within the glossy old walnut bar that ran from wall to wall, the eyes of the lawyers and reporters wandered often to ariel as she sat in the packed courtroom watching loudon's fight for the life and liberty of happy fear she had always three escorts and though she did not miss a session and the same three never failed to attend her no whisper of scandal arose but not upon them did all the glances of the members of the bar and the journalists with tender frequency linger nor were the younger members of these two professions all that gazed that way 
joe had fought out the selection of the jury with a prosecutor at great length and with infinite pains it was not a young jury and it stared at her the court wore a gray beard with which a flock of sparrows might have villaged a grove and yet in spite of the vital necessity of watchfulness over this fighting case it once needed to be stirred from a trance-like gaze in miss tabor's direction and aroused to the realization that it was there to sit and not to dream the august air was warm outside the windows inviting to the open country to swimming hole to orchard reveries or shaded pool wherein to drop a meditative line he would have thought no one could willingly coop himself in this hot room for three hours twice a day while lawyers wrangled often unintelligibly over the life of a dingy little creature like happy fear yet the struggle to swelter there was almost like a riot and the bailiffs were busy men it was a fighting case throughout fought to a finish on each tiny point as it came up dragging in the mere matter of time interminably yet the people of canaan not only those who succeeded in penetrating to the courtroom but the others who hung about the corridors or outside the building and the great mass of stay-at-homes who read the story in the tocsin found each moment of it enthralling enough the state's attorney fearful of losing so notorious a case and not underestimating his opponent had modestly summoned others to his aid and the attorney for the defence single-handed faced an array of legal talent such as seldom indeed had hollered at this bar faced it good-naturedly an eyebrow crooked up and his head on one side most of the time yet faced it indomitably he had a certain careless and disarming smile when he lost a point which carried off the defeat as of only a humorous account and not at all part of the serious business in hand and in his treatment of witnesses he was plausible kindly knowing that in this case he had no intending perjurer to entrap brought in play the rare and delicate art of which he was a master employing in his questions subtle suggestions and shadings of tone and manner and avoiding words of debatable and dangerous meanings a fine craft often attempted by blunderers to their own undoing but which practised by joseph louden made inarticulate witnesses articulate to the precise effects which he desired this he accomplished as much by the help of the continuous fire of objections from the other side as in spite of them he was infinitely careful asking never an ill-advised question for the other side to use to his hurt and though exhibiting only a pleasant easiness of manner was electrically alert a hundred things had shown ariel that the feeling of the place influenced by public sentiment without was subtly and profoundly hostile to joe and his client she read this in the spectators in the jury even in the judge but it seemed to her that day by day the inimical spirit gradually failed inside the railing and also in those spectators who like herself were enabled by special favor to be present throughout the trial and that now and then a kindlier sentiment began to be manifested she was unaware how strongly she contributed to effect this herself not only through the glow of visible sympathy which radiated from her but by a particular action claudine was called by the state and told as much of her story as the law permitted her to tell interlarding her replies with fervent protestations too quick to be prevented that she never meant to bring no trouble to mr fear and that she did hate to have gentlemen starting things on her account when the defence took this perturbed witness her interpolations became less frequent and she described straightforwardly how she found the pistol on the floor near the prostrate figure of corey and hidden it in her own dress the attorneys for the state listened with a somewhat cynical amusement to this portion of her testimony believing it of no account uncorroborated and that if necessary the state could impeach the witness on the ground that it had been indispensable to produce her 
she came down weeping from the stand and the next witness not being immediately called the eyes of the jurymen naturally followed her as she passed to her seat and they saw ariel tabor bow gravely to her across the railing now a thousand things not set forth by legislatures lawmen and judges affect a jury and the slight salutation caused the members of this one to glance at one another for it seemed to imply that the exquisite lady in white not only knew claudine but knew that she had spoken the truth it was not after this that a feeling favorable to the defense now and then noticeably manifested itself in the courtroom still when the evidence for the state was all in the life of happy fear seemed to rest in a balance precarious indeed and the little man swallowing pitifully looked at his attorney with the eyes of a sick dog then joe gave the prosecutors an illuminating and stunning surprise and having offered in evidence the revolver found upon claudine produced as his first witness a pawnbroker of denver who identified the weapon as one he had sold to cory whom he had known very well the second witness also a stranger had been even more intimately acquainted with the dead man and there began to be an uneasy comprehension of what joe had accomplished during that prolonged absence of his which had so nearly cost the life of the little mongrel who was at present most blissfully respectability a lively convalescent in ariel's back yard the second witness also identified the revolver testifying that he had borrowed it from cory in st louis to settle a question of marksmanship and that on his returning it to the owner the latter then working his way eastward had confided to him his intention of stopping in canaan for the purpose of exercising its melancholy functions upon a man who had once done him good in that city by the time the witness had reached this point the prosecutor and his assistants were on their feet excitedly shouting objections which were promptly overruled taken unawares they fought for time thunder was loosed forensic bellowings everybody lost their temper except joe and the examination of the witness proceeded cory with that singular inspiration to confide in some one which is the characteristic and the undoing of his kind had outlined his plan of operations to the witness with perfect clarity he would first attempt so he had declared to incite an attack upon himself by playing upon the jealousy of his victim having already made a tentative effort in that direction failing in this he would fall back upon one of the dozen schemes for he was ready in such matters he bragged the most likely of which would be to play the peacemaker he would talk of his good intentions toward his enemy speaking publicly of him in friendly and gentle ways then getting at him secretly destroy him in such a fashion as to leave open for himself the kind gate of self-defense in brief here was the whole tally of what had actually occurred with the exception of the last account in the sequence which had proved that demise for which cory had not arranged and it fell from the lips of a witness whom the prosecution had no means of impeaching when he left the stand unshaken and undiscredited after a frantic cross-examination joe turning to resume his seat let his hand fall lightly for a second upon his client's shoulder that was the occasion of a demonstration which indicated a sentiment favorable to the defense on the part of at least three of the spectators and it was in the nature of such a hammering of canes upon the bare wooden floor as effectually stopped all other proceedings instantly the indignant judge fixed the colonel peter bradbury and squire buckaloo with his glittering eye yet the hammering continued unabated and the offenders surely would have been conducted forth in ignominy had not gallantry prevailed even in that formal place the judge reluctantly realizing that some latitude must be allowed to these aged enthusiasts 
since they somehow seemed to belong to miss tabor made his remarks general with the time-worn threat to clear the room whereupon the loyal survivors of eskew relapsed into unabashed silence it was now as joe had said a clear enough case only the case itself however was clear for as he and his friends feared the verdict might possibly be neither in accordance with the law of the facts nor the convictions of the jury eugene's defection had not altered the tone of the tocsin all day long a crowd of men and boys hung about the corridors of the courthouse about the square and the neighboring streets and from these rose sombre murmurs more and more ominous the public sentiment of a community like canaan can make itself felt inside a courtroom and it was strongly exerted against happy fear the tocsin had always been a powerful agent judge pike had increased its strength with a staff which was thoroughly efficient alert and always able to strike centre with the paper's readers and in town and country it had absorbed the circulation of the other local journals had resisted feebly at times but in the matter of the corey murder had not dared to do anything except follow the tocsin's lead the tocsin having lit the fire fed it fed its saltpetre and sulphur for now martin pike was fighting hard the farmers and people of the less urban parts of the country were accustomed to form their opinions upon the tocsin they regarded it as the single immutable rock of journalistic righteousness and wisdom in the world consequently stirred by the outbursts of the paper they came into canaan in great numbers and though the pressure from the town itself was so strong that only a few of them managed to crowd into the courtroom the others joined their voices to those sombre murmurs outdoors which increased in loudness as the trial went on the tocsin however was not having everything its own way the volume of outcry against happy fear and his lawyer had diminished it was noticed in very respectable quarters the information imparted by mike sheehan to the politicians at mr farbach's had been slowly seeping through the various social strata of the town and though at first incredulously rejected it began to find acceptance upper main street cooling appreciably in its acceptance of the tocsin as the law and the prophets there were even a few who dared to wonder in their hearts if there had not been a mistake about joe loudon and although mrs flitcroft weakened not the relatives of squire buckaloo and of peter bradbury began to hold up their heads a little after having made home horrible for those gentlemen and reproached them with their conversation as the last word of senile shame in addition the colonel's grandson and mr bradbury's grandson had both mystifyingly lent countenance to joe consorting with him openly the former for his own purposes the latter because he had cunningly discovered that it was a way to mrs tabor's regard which since her gentle rejection of him he had grown to believe good youth might be the pleasantest thing that could ever come to him in short the question had begun to thrive was it possible that eskew art had not been insane after all the best of those who gathered ominously about the courthouse and its purlieu were the young farmers and field hands artisans and clerks one of the latter being a pimply-faced young man lately from the doctor's hands who limped and would limp for the rest of his life he who of all men held the memory of eskew arp in least respect and was burningly desirous to revenge himself upon the living the worst were of that mystifying embryonic semi-rowdy type the american voyou in the production of which canaan and her sister towns everywhere over the country were prolific the young man youth boy perhaps creature of nameless age whose clothes are like those of a brakeman out of work but who is not a brakeman in or out of work 
wearing the black soft hat tilted forward to shelter as a counter does the contempt of a clerk that expression which the face does not dare wear quite in the open asserting the possession of supreme capacity and wit strength dexterity and amours the dirty handkerchief under the collar the short black coat always double-breasted the eyelids sooty one cheek always bulged the forehead speckled the lips cracked horrible teeth and the affectation of possessing secret information upon all matters of the universe above all the instinct of finding the shortest way to any scene of official interest to the police fireman or ambulance surgeon a singular being not professionally criminal tough histrionically rather than really full of its own argo of brag hysterical when crossed timid through great ignorance and therefore dangerous it furnishes not the leaders but the mass of mobs and it springs up at times of crisis from heaven knows where you might have driven through all the streets of canaan a week before the trial and have seen four or five such fellows but from the day of its beginning the square was full of them dingy shuttlecocks batted up into view by the tocsin they kept the air whirring with their noise the news of that sitting which had caused the squire flitcroft and peter bradbury to risk the court's displeasure was greeted outside with loud and vehement disfavor and when at noon the jurymen were marshalled out to cross the yard to the national house for dinner a large crowd followed and surrounded them until they reached the doors of the hotel don't let lawyer loud and bamboozle you hang him tar and feathers for ye if ye don't hang him these were the mildest threats and joe louden watching from an upper window of the courthouse observed with a troubled eye how certain of the jury shrank from the pressure of the throng how the cheeks of others showed sudden pallor sometimes public sentiment has done evil things to those who have not shared it and joe knew how rare a thing is a jury which dares to stand square against a town like canaan aroused the end of the afternoon session saw another point marked for the defence joe had put the defendant on the stand and the little man had proved an excellent witness during his life he had been many things many things disreputable high standards were not brightly illumined for him in the beginning of the night march which his life had been he had been a tramp afterward a petty gambler but his great motive had finally come to be the intention to do what joe told him to do that and to keep claudine as straight as he could in a measure these were the two things that had brought him to the pass in which he now stood his loyalty to joe and his resentment of whatever tampered with claudine's straightness he was submissive to the consequences he was still loyal and now joe asked him to tell just what happened and happy obeyed with crystal clearness throughout the long tricky cross-examination he continued to tell just what happened with a plaintive truthfulness not to be imitated and throughout it joe guarded him from pitfalls for lawyers in their search after truth are compelled by the exigencies of their profession to make pitfalls even for the honest and gave him by various devices time to remember though not to think and made the words come right in his mouth so that before the sitting was over a disquieting rumor ran through the waiting crowd in the corridors across the square and over the town that the case was surely going loudon's way this was also the opinion of a looker-on in canaan a ferret-faced counsellor of corporations who called to consultation with the eminent buckaloo nephew of the squire had afterwards spent an hour in his company at the trial it's going that young fellow loudon's way said the stranger you say he's a shyster but well admitted buckaloo with some reluctance i don't mean that exactly 
I've got an old uncle who seems lately to think he's a great man. I'll take your uncle's word for it, returned the other, smiling. I think he'll go pretty far. They had come to the flight of steps which descended to the yard, and the visitor, looking down upon the angry crowd, added, If they don't kill him. Joe himself was anxious concerning no such matter. He shook hands with Happy at the end of the sitting, bidding him to be of good cheer, and, when the little man had marched away under a strong guard, began to gather and sort his papers at a desk inside the bar. This took him perhaps five minutes, and when he had finished there were only three people left in the room, a clerk, a negro janitor with a broom, and the darky friend who always hopefully accompanies a colored man holding high public office. These two approvingly greeted the young lawyer, the janitor handing him a note from Norbert Flitcroft, and the friend mechanically borrowing a quarter from him as he opened the envelope. I'll be round your way to get a box of cigars, laughed the friend. Soon as the campaign open up good, you all going to vote your way down on the levee bank, but they sure expects to get a smoke a little for elections day. We knows who's our friend. Norbert's missive was lengthy and absorbing. Joe went on his way, perusing it with profound attention, but as he descended the stairway to the floor below, a loud burst of angry shouting outside the building caused him to hasten toward the big front doors which faced Main Street. The doors opened upon an imposing vestibule, from which a handsome flight of stone steps, protected by a marble balustrade, led to the ground. Standing at the top of these steps and leaning over the balustrade, he had a clear view of half the yard. No one was near him everybody was running in the opposite direction toward that corner of the yard occupied by the jail the crowd centering upon an agitated whirlpool of men which had moved slowly toward a door in the high wall that enclosed the building and joe saw that happy fear's guards conducting the prisoner back to his cell were being jostled and rushed the distance they had made was short but as they reached the door the pressure upon them increased dangerously clubs rose in the air hats flew the whirlpool heaved tumultuously and the steel door clanged happy fear was safe inside but the jostlers were outside baffled ugly and stirred with the passion that changes a crowd into a mob then some of them caught sight of joe as he stood alone at the top of the steps and a great shout of rage and exultation arose for a moment or two he did not see his danger. At the clang of the door, his eyes, caught by the gleam of a wide white hat, had turned toward the street, and he was somewhat fixedly watching Mr. Ladew extricate Ariel and her aged and indignant escorts from an overflow of the crowd in which they had been caught. But a voice warned him, the wild piping of a newsboy who had climbed into a tree nearby. Joe Loudon, he screamed, look out! with a muffled roar the crowd surged back from the jail and turned toward the steps tar and feather him take him over to the river and throw him in drown him hang him then a thing happened which was dramatic enough in its inception but almost ludicrous in its effect joe walked quietly down the steps and toward the advancing mob with his head cocked to one side one eyebrow lifted and one corner of his mouth drawn down in a faintly distorted smile he went straight toward the yelling forerunners with only a small bundle of papers in his hands and then while the non-partisan spectators held their breath expecting the shock of contact straight on through them a number of the bulge cheeked formed the scattering van of these forerunners charging with hoarse and cruel shrieks of triumph the first apparently about to tear joseph loudon to pieces changed countenance at arm's length swerved violently and with a loud cry head him off dashed on up the stone steps the man next behind him followed his lead with the same shout strategy and haste then the others of this advance attack finding themselves confronting the quiet man who kept his even pace and showed no intention of turning aside for them 
turned suddenly aside for him and taking the cue from the first pursued their way bellowing head him off head him off until there were a dozen and more rowdish men and youths upon the steps their eyes blazing with fury menacing loudon's back with frightful gestures across the marble balustrade as they hysterically bleated the course head him off whether or not joe could have walked through the entire mob as he had walked through these is a matter for speculation it was believed in canaan that he could already a gust of mirth began to sweep over the sterner spirits as they paused to marvel no less at the disconcerting advance of the lawyer than at the spectacle presented by the intrepid daredevils upon the steps a kind of lane actually opening before the young man as he walked steadily on and when mr sheehan leading half a dozen huge men from the far-back brewery unceremoniously shouldered away through the mob to joe's side reaching him where the press was thickest it is a question if the services of his detachment were needed the laughter increased it became voluminous homeric salvos shook the air and never one of the fire-eaters upon the steps lived long enough to live down the hateful cry of that day head him off which was to become a catchword on the streets a taunt more stinging than any devised by deliberate invention an insult bitterer than the ancestral doubt a fighting word and the great historical joke of canaan never omitted in after days when the tale was told how joe louden took that short walk across the courthouse yard which made him mayor of canaan end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the conquest of canaan by booth tarkington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four martin pike keeps an engagement an hour later martin pike looking forth from the mansion saw a man open the gate and passing between the unemotional deer rapidly approach the house he was a thin young fellow very well dressed in dark gray his hair prematurely somewhat silvered his face prematurely somewhat lined and his hat covered a scar such as might have been caused by a blow from a blunt instrument in the nature of a poker he did not reach the door nor was there necessity for him to ring for before he had set foot on the lowest step the judge had hastened to meet him not however with any fulsomely hospitable intent his hand and arm were raised to execute one of his olympian gestures of the kind which had obliterated the young man upon a certain bygone morning loudon looked up calmly at the big figure towering above him it won't do judge he said that was all but there was a significance in his manner and a certainty in his voice which caused the uplifted hand to drop limply while the look of apprehension which of late had grown more and more to be martin pike's habitual expression deepened into something close upon mortal anxiety have you any business to set foot upon my property he demanded yes answered joe that's why i came what business have you got with me enough to satisfy you i think but there's one thing i don't want to do joe glanced at the open door and that is to talk about it here for your own sake and because i think miss tabor should be present i called to ask you to come to her house at eight o'clock to-night you did martin pike spoke angrily but not in the bull bass of yore and he kept his voice down glancing about him nervously as though he feared that his wife or mamie might hear my accounts with her estate are closed he said harshly if she wants anything let her come here joe shook his head no you must be there at eight o'clock the judge's collar got the best of his uneasiness you're a pretty one to come ordering me around he broke out you slanderer do you suppose i haven't heard how you're going about traducing me 
undermining my character in this community spreading scandals that i'm the real owner of beaver beach it can easily be proved judge joe interrupted quietly though you're wrong i haven't been telling people i haven't needed to even if i'd wished once a thing like that gets out you can't stop it ever that isn't all to my knowledge you own other property worse than the beach i know that you own half of the worst bins in the town profitable investments too you bought them very gradually and craftily only showing the deeds to those in charge as you did to mike sheehan and not recording them sheehan's betrayal of you gave me the key i know most of the poor creatures who are your tenants too you see and that gave me an advantage because they have some confidence in me my investigations have been almost as quiet and careful as your purchases you damn blackmailer the judge bent upon him a fierce inquiring scrutiny in which oddly enough there was a kind of haggard hopefulness and out of such stories he sneered you're going to try and make political capital against the tocsin are you no said joe it was necessary in the interests of my client for me to know pretty thoroughly just what property you own and i think i do these pieces i've mentioned are about all you have not mortgaged you couldn't do that without exposure and you've kept a controlling interest in the tocsin clear too for the sake of its influence i suppose now do you want to hear any more or will you agree to meet me at miss tabor's this evening whatever the look of hopefulness had signified it fled from pike's face during this speech but he asked with some show of contempt do you think it likely very well said joe if you want me to speak here and he came a little closer to him you bought a big block of granger gas for roger tabor he began in a low voice before his death you sold everything he had except the old house put it all into cash for him and bought that stock you signed the check as his attorney in fact and it came back to you through washington national where norbert flitcroft handled it he has a good memory and when he told me what he knew i had him do some tracing did a little myself also judge pike i must tell you that you stand in danger of the law you were the custodian of that stock for roger tabor it was transferred in blank though i think you meant it to be legal at that time and that was merely for convenience in case roger had wished you to sell it for him but just after his death you found yourself saddled with distillery stock which was going bad on your hands other speculations of yours were failing at the same time you had to have money you filed your report as administrator crediting miss tabor with your own stock which you knew was going to the wall and transferred hers to yourself then you sold it because you needed ready money you used her fortune to save yourself but you were horribly afraid no matter how rotten your transactions had been you had always kept inside the law and now that you had gone outside of it you were frightened you didn't dare come flat out to miss tabor with the statement that her fortune had gone it had been in your charge all the time and things might look ugly so you put it off perhaps from day to day you didn't dare tell her until you were forced to and to avoid the confession you sent her the income which was rightfully hers that was your great weakness joe had spoken with great rapidity though keeping his voice low and he lowered it again as he continued judge pike what chance have you to be believed in court when you swear that you sent her twenty thousand dollars out of the goodness of your heart you think she believed you it was the very proof to her that you had robbed her for she knew you you want to hear more now you think this is a good place for it you wish me to go over the details of each step i've taken against you to land you at the bar where this poor fellow your paper is hounding stands to-day the judge essayed to answer and could not he lifted his hand uncertainly and dropped it while the thick dew gathered on his temples inarticulate sounds came from between his teeth you will come said joe martin pike bent his head dazedly 
and at that the other turned quickly from him and went away without looking back ariel was in the studio half an hour later when joe was announced by the smiling mr warden laddie was with her though upon the point of taking his leave and joe marked with a sinking heart that the young minister's cheeks were flushed and his eyes very bright it was a magnificent thing you did mr loudon he said offering his hand heartily i saw it and it was even finer in one way than it was plucky it somehow straightened things out with such perfect good nature it made those people feel that what they were doing was ridiculous so it was said joe few under the circumstances could have acted as if they thought so and i hope you'll let me call upon you mr loudon i hope you will he answered and then when the minister had departed stood looking after him with sad eyes in which there dwelt obscure meditations Ladue's word of farewell had covered a deep look at ariel which was not to be mistaken by joseph loudon for anything other than what it was the clergyman's secret was an open one and joe saw that he was as frank and manly in love as in all other things he's a good fellow he said at last sighing a good man ariel agreed and he said more to me than he did to you yes i think it probable joe smiled sorrowfully about you i mean he had time to fear that her look admitted confusion before she proceeded he said he had never seen anything so fine as your coming down those steps ah he was right but it was harder for me to watch you i think than for you to do it joe i was so horribly afraid in the crowd between us if we could have got near you but we couldn't we she faltered and pressed her hand close upon her eyes we said joe slowly you mean you and mr ladew yes he was there but i mean her voice ran into a little laugh with a beatific quaver in it i mean colonel flitcroft and mr bradbury and mr buckaloo too we were hemmed in together when mr ladew found us and old joe when that cowardly rush started toward you those three i've heard wonderful things in paris and naples cabmen quarrelling and disappointed beggars but never anything like them to-day you mean they were profane oh magnificently and with such inventiveness all three begged my pardon afterwards i didn't grant it i blessed them did they beg mr ladew's pardon oh joe she reproached him he isn't a prig and he's had to fight some things that you of all men ought to understand he's only been here a few months but he told me that judge pike has been against him from the start it seems that mr ladew is too liberal in his views and he told me that if it were not for judge pike's losing influence in the church on account of the beaver beach story the judge would probably have been able to force him to resign but now he will stay he wishes to stay doesn't he very much i think and joe she continued thoughtfully i want you to do something for me i want you to go to church with me next sunday you hear mr ladew yes i wouldn't ask except for that very well he consented with averted eyes i'll go her face was radiant with the smile she gave him it will make me very happy she said he bent his head and fumbled over some papers he had taken from his pocket will you listen to these memoranda we have a great deal to go over before eight o'clock judge pike stood for a long while where joe had left him staring out at the street apparently really he saw nothing undoubtedly an image of blurring foliage cast iron cement and turf with sunshine smeared over all flickered upon the retinas of his eyes but the brain did not accept the picture from the optic nerve martin pike was busy with other visions joe loudon had followed him back to his hidden deeds and had read them aloud to him as gabriel would read them on judgment day perhaps this was the judgment day pike had taken charge of roger tabor's affairs because the commissions as agent were not too inconsiderable to be neglected to make the task simpler he had sold as time went on the various properties of the estate 
gradually converting all of them into cash then the opportunity offering he bought a stock which paid excellent dividends had it transferred in blank because if it should prove to roger's advantage to sell it his agent could do so without any formal delays between paris and canaan at least that is what the judge had told himself at the time though it may be that some lurking whisperer in his soul had hinted that it might be well to preserve the great amount of cash in hand and roger's stock was practically that then came the evil days laboriously he had built up a name for conservatism which most of the town accepted but secretly he had always been a gambler wall street his goal to adventure there as one of the great single-eyed cyclopean man-eaters his fond ambition and he had conceived the distillery trust as a means to attain it but the structure tumbled about his ears other edifices of his crumbled at the same time he found himself beset his solvency endangered and there was the taper stock quite as good as gold roger had just died and it was enough to save him save that was a strange way to be remembering it today, when fate grinned at him out of a dreadful mask contorted like the face of norbert flitcroft martin pike knew himself for a fool what chance had he though he destroyed the check a thousand times over to escape the records by which the coil of modern trade duplicates and quadruplicates each slip of scribbled paper what chance had he against the memories of men would the man of whom he had bought forget that the check was signed by roger's agent had the bank clerk forgotten thrice fool martin pike to dream that in a town like canaan norbert or any of his kind could touch an order for so great a sum and forget it but martin pike had not dreamed that had dreamed nothing when failure confronted him his mind refused to consider anything but his vital need at the time and he had supplied that need and now he grew busy with the future he saw first the civil suit for restitution pressed with the ferocity and cunning of one who intended to satisfy a grudge of years then perhaps a criminal prosecution but he would fight it did they think that such a man was to be overthrown by a breath of air by a girl a bank clerk and a shyster lawyer they would find their case difficult to prove in court he did not believe they could prove it they would be discredited for the attempt upon him and he would win clear these beaver beach scandals would die of inertia presently there would be a lucky trick in wheat and martin pike would be martin pike once more reinstated dictator of church politics business all those things which were the breath of his life restored he would show this pitiful pack what manner of man they hounded no but flitcroft the judge put his big hand up to his eyes and rubbed them curious mechanisms the eyes that deer in line with the vision not a zebra a zebra after all these years and yet curious indeed the eyes a zebra who ever heard of a deer with stripes the big hand rose from the eyes and ran through the hair which had been always worn rather long it would seem strange to have it cut very short did they use clippers perhaps he started suddenly and realized that his next-door neighbor had passed along the sidewalk with head averted pretending not to see him a few weeks ago the man would not have missed the chance of looking in to bow with proper deference to did he know he could not know this it must be the beaver beach scandal it must be it could not be this not yet but it might be how many knew loudon norbert ariel who else and again the deer took on the strange zebra look the judge walked slowly down to the gate spoke to the man he had employed in sam warden's place a scotchman who had begun to refresh the lawn with a garden hose 
bowed Appleby in response to the salutation of the elder Loudon, who was passing, bound homeward from the factory, and returned to the house with thoughtful steps. In the hall he encountered his wife, stopped to speak with her upon various household matters, then entered the library, which was his workroom. He locked the door, tried it, and shook the handle. After satisfying himself of its security, he pulled down the window shades carefully, and, lighting a gas drop lamp upon his desk, began to fumble with various documents, which he took from a small safe nearby. But his hands were not steady. He dropped the papers, scattering them over the floor, and had great difficulty in picking them up. He perspired heavily. Whatever he touched became damp, and he continually mopped his forehead with his sleeve. After a time he gave up the attempt to sort the packets of papers, sank into the chair despairingly, leaving most of them in disorder. A light tap sounded on the door. "'Martin, it's supper-time.' With a great effort he made shift to answer. "'Yes, I know. You and Mamie go ahead. I'm too busy tonight. I don't want anything.' A moment before he had been a pitiful figure, face distraught, hands incoherent, the whole body incoordinate. But if eyes might have rested upon him as he answered his wife, they would have seen a strange thing. He sat, apparently steady and collected, his expression cool, his body quiet, poised exactly to the quality of his reply, for the same strange reason that a young girl smiles archly and coquettes to a telephone. "'But, Martin, you oughtn't to work so hard. You'll break down.' "'No fear of that,' he replied cheerfully. "'You can leave something on the sideboard for me.' After another fluttering remonstrance, she went away, and the room was silent again. His arms rested upon the desk, and his head slowly sank between his elbows. When he lifted it again, the clock on the mantelpiece had tinkled once. It was half-past seven. He took a sheet of notepaper from a box before him and began to write. But when he had finished the words, My dear wife and Mamie, his fingers shook so violently that he could go no further. He placed his left hand over the back of his right to steady it, but found the device unavailing. The pen left mere zigzags on the page, and he dropped it. He opened a lower drawer of the desk and took out of it a pistol, rose, went to the door, tried it once more, and again was satisfied of his seclusion. Then he took the weapon in both hands, the handle against his fingers, one thumb against the trigger, and shaking with nausea, lifted it to the level of his eyes. His will betrayed him. He could not contact his thumb upon the trigger, and with a convulsive shiver he dropped the revolver upon the desk. He locked the door of the room behind him, crept down the stairs, and out of the front door. He walked shamblingly when he reached the street, keeping close to the fences as he went on, now and then touching the pickets with his hands like a feeble old man. He had always been prompt. It was one of the things of which he had been proud. In all his life he had never failed to keep a business engagement precisely upon the appointed time, and the courthouse bell clanged eight when Sam Warden opened the door for his old employer tonight. The two young people looked up gravely from the script-laden table before them as Martin Pike came into the strong lamplight out of the dimness of the hall, where only a taper burned. He shambled a few limp steps into the room and came to a halt. Big as he was, his clothes hung upon him loosely, like coverlets upon a collapsed bed, and he seemed but a distorted image of himself, as if, save for the dull and reddened eyes, he had been made of yellowish wax and had been left too long in the sun. Abject, hopeless, his attitude a confession of ruin and shame, he stood before his judges in such wretchedness that in comparison the figure of happy fear facing the courtroom through his darkest hour was one to be ended. Well, he said brokenly, what are you going to do? 
Joe Louden looked at him with great intentness for several moments. Then he rose and came forward. Sit down, Judge, he said. It's all right. Don't worry. End of chapter 24Chapter 25 of The Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The Jury Comes In. Mrs. Flitcroft, at breakfast on the following morning, continued a disquisition which had ceased the previous night only because of a provoking human incapacity to exist without sleep. Her theme was one which had exclusively occupied her since the passing of Eskew, and her rheumatism having improved so that she could leave her chair, she had become a sort of walking serial. Norbert and his grandfather being well assured that whenever they left the house the same story was to be continued upon their reappearance. The tocsin had been her great comfort. She was but one helpless woman against two strong men therefore she sorely needed assistance in her attack upon them and the invaluable newspaper gave it in generous measure yes young man she said as she lifted her first spoonful of oatmeal you better read the tocsin i am reading it responded norbert who was almost concealed by the paper and your grandfather better read it she continued severely i already have said the colonel promptly have you no but you can be sure i will the good lady gave the effect of tossing her head and you better take what it says to heart you and some others it's a wonder to me that you and buckaloo and old peter don't go and hold that happy fear's hand during the trial and as for joe louden his stepmother's own sister jane says to me only yesterday afternoon why law mrs flitcroft she says it's a wonder to me she says that your husband and those two other old fools don't lay down in the gutter and let that joe louden walk over em the jane quimbleys say those two other old fools inquired the colonel in a manner which indicated that he might see mr quimby in regard to the slander i can't say as i remember just precisely her exact words admitted mrs flitcroft but that was the sense of it you've made yourselves the laughing-stock of the whole town Oh, we have and i'd like to know her voice became shrill and goading i'd like to know what judge pike thinks of you and norbert i should think you'd be ashamed to have him pass you in the street i quit speaking to him said norbert coldly ever since i heard he owned beaver beach that story ain't proved yet returned his grandmother with much irascibility well it will be but that's not all norbert wagged his head you may be a little surprised within the next few days i've been surprised for the past few she replied with a bitterness which overrode her satisfaction in the effectiveness of the retort surprised i'd like to know who wouldn't be surprised when half the town acts like it's gone crazy people praising that fellow that nobody in their sober minds and senses never in their lives had a good word for before why there was more talk yesterday about his doings at the courthouse you'd have thought he was phil sheridan it's joe louden here and joe louden there and joe louden this and joe louden that till i'm sick of the name then why don't you quit saying it asked the colonel reasonably because it ought to be said she exclaimed with great heat because he'd ought to be held up to the community to be despised you let me have that paper a minute she pursued vehemently you just let me have the tocsin and i'll read you out some things about him that'll show him in his true light all right said norbert suddenly handing her the paper go ahead and after the exchange of a single glance the two gentlemen composed themselves to listen ha huh, exclaimed mrs flitcroft here it is in the headlines on the first page defense scores again and again ridiculous behavior of a would-be mob loudon's she paused removed her spectacles examined them dubiously restored them to place and continued 
loudness masterly conduct and well deserved she paused again incredulous well deserved triumph go on said the colonel softly indeed i will the old lady replied do you think i don't know sarcasm when i see it <laughs> she laughed with great heartiness i reckon i will go on you listen and try to learn something from it she resumed the reading it is generally admitted that after yesterday's sitting of the court the prosecution in the fear cory murder trial has not a leg to stand on loudon's fight for his client has been it must be confessed of a most splendid and talented order and the bottom has fallen out of the case for the state while a verdict of not guilty it is now conceded as the general wish of those who have attended and followed the trial but the most interesting event of the day took place after the session when some miscreants undertook to mob the attorney for the defense in the courthouse yard he met the attack with a coolness and nerve which have won him a popularity that mrs flitcroft again faltered go on repeated the colonel there's a great deal more look at the editorials suggested norbert there's one on the same subject mrs flitcroft her theory of the tocsin's sarcasm somewhat shaken turned the page we confess a mistake was the rubric above the leader and she uttered a cry of triumph for she thought the mistake was what she had just been reading and that the editorial would apologize for the incomprehensible journalistic error upon the first page the best of us make mistakes and it is well to have a change of heart sometimes thus eugene's successor had written and so mrs flitcroft read an open confession is good for the soul the tocsin has changed its mind in regard to certain matters and means to say so freely and frankly after yesterday's events in connection with the murder trial before our public the evidence being now all presented for we understand that neither side has more to offer it is generally conceded that all good citizens are hopeful of a verdict of acquittal and the tocsin is a good citizen no good citizen would willingly see an innocent man punished and that our city is not to be disgraced by such a miscarriage of justice is due to the efforts of the attorney for the defendant who has gained credit not only by his masterly management of this case but by his splendid conduct in the face of danger yesterday afternoon he has distinguished himself so greatly that we frankly assert that our citizens may point with pride to mrs flitcroft's voice at the beginning pitched to a high exultation had gradually lowered in key and dropped down the scale till it disappeared altogether it's a wonder to me the colonel began that the tocsin doesn't go and hold joe loudon's hand i'll read the rest of it for you said norbert his heavy face lighting up with cruelty let's see where were you oh yes point with pride our citizens may point with pride to let us not linger to observe the unmanly behavior of an aged man and his grandson left alone at the breakfast-table by a defenseless woman the tocsin's right-about face undermined others besides mrs flitcroft that morning and rejoiced greater though not better men than the colonel mr farbach and his lieutenant smiled yet stared amazed wondering what had happened that was a thing which only three people even certainly knew yet it was very simple the tocsin was part of the judge's restitution the controlling interest in the paper together with the other property i've listed joe had said studying his memoranda under the lamp in roger's old studio while martin pike listened with his head in his hands make up what miss tabor is willing to accept as i estimated their total value is between a third and a half of that stock which belonged to her but this boy flitcroft said pike 
feebly. He might— He will do nothing, interrupted Joe. The case is settled out of court. And even if he were disposed to harass you, he could hardly hope to succeed, since Miss Tabor declines either to sue or to prosecute. The judge winced at the last word. Yes, yes, I know, but he might, he might tell. I think Miss Tabor's influence will prevent. If it should not, well, you're not in a desperate case by any means. You're involved, but far from stripped. In time you may be as sound as ever, and if Norbert tells, there's nothing for you to do but to live it down. A faint smile played upon Joe's lips as he lifted his head and looked at the other. It can be done, I think. It was then that Ariel, complaining of the warmth of the evening, thought it possible that Joe might find her fan upon the porch, and as he departed, whispered hurriedly, Judge Pike, I'm not technically in control of the toxin, but haven't I the right to control its policy? I understand, he muttered. You mean about Loudon, about this trial? That is why I have taken the paper. You want all that changed, you mean? She nodded decisively. From this instant, before morning. Oh, well, I'll go down there and give the word. He rubbed his eyes warily with big thumbs. I'm through fighting. I'm done. Besides, what's the use? There's nothing more to fight. Now, Judge, Joe said as he came in briskly, we'll go over the list of that unencumbered property, if you will. This unencumbered property consisted of Beaver Beach and those other belongings of the judge which he had not dared to mortgage. Joe had somehow explained their nature to Ariel, and these with the toxin she had elected to accept in restitution. You told me once that I ought to look after my own property, and now I will. Don't you see? she cried to Joe eagerly. It's my work. She resolutely set aside every other proposition, and this was the quality of mercy which Martin Pike found that night. There was a great crowd to hear Joe's summing up at the trial, and those who succeeded in getting into the courtroom declared that it was worth the struggle. He did not orate, he did not thunder at the jury, nor did he slyly flatter them. He did not overdo the confidential, nor seem so secure of understanding beforehand what their verdict would be that they felt an instinctive desire to fool him. He talked colloquially, but clearly, without appeal to the pathetic and without garnitures, not mentioning sunsets, birds, oceans, homes, the glorious old state, or the happiness of liberty but he made everybody in the room quite sure that happy fear had fired the shot which killed cory to save his own life and that as mr bradbury remarked to the colonel was what joe was there for ariel's escort was increased to four that day mr ladew sat beside her and there were times when joe kept his mind entirely to the work in hand only by an effort but he always succeeded the sight of the pale and worshipping face of happy fear from the corner of his eye was enough to ensure that and people who could not get near the doors asking those who could what's he doing now were answered by variations of the one formula oh just walking away with it once the courtroom was disturbed and set in an uproar which even the judge's customary threat failed to subdue joe had been talking very rapidly and having turned the point he was making with perfect dexterity the jury listening eagerly stopped for a moment to take a swallow of water a voice rose over the low hum of the crowd in a delirious chuckle why don't somebody head him off the room instantly rocked with laughter under cover of which the identity of the sacrilegious chuckler was not discovered but the voice was the voice of buckaloo who was incredibly surprised to find that he had spoken aloud the jury were out after the case had been given to them seventeen minutes and thirty seconds by the watch caudine held in her hand the little man whose fate was now on the knees of the gods looked pathetically at the foreman and then at the face of his lawyer and began to shake violently but not with fright 
He had gone to the jail on Joe's word, as a good dog goes where his master bids, trustfully, and yet Happy had not been able to keep his mind from considering the horrible chances. Don't worry, Joe had said. It's all right. I'll see you through. And he had kept his word. The little man was cleared. It took Happy a long time to get through what he had to say to his attorney in the ante-room, and even then, of course, he did not manage to put it in words, for he had broken down with sheer gratitude. Why, damn me, Joe, he sobbed. If ever I, if ever you, well, by God, if you ever... This was the substance of his lingual accomplishment under the circumstances. But Claudine threw her arms around poor Joe's neck and kissed him. Many people were waiting to shake hands with Joe and congratulate him. The trio, taking advantage of seats near the rail, had already done that, somewhat uproariously, before he had followed Happy, and so had Ariel and Ladue, both necessarily rather hurriedly. But in the corridors he found, when he came out of the ante-room, clients, acquaintances, friends, old friends, new friends, and friends he had never seen before, everybody beaming upon him and wringing his hand, as if they had been sure of it all from the start. "'Know him?' said one to another. "'Why, I've known him since he was that high. Smart little fellow he was, too. This was a total stranger. I said years ago, thus mr brown the national house clerk proving his prophetic vision that he'd turn out to be a big man some day they gathered round him if he stopped for an instant and crowded after him admiringly when he went on again making his progress slow when he finally came out of the big doors into the sunshine there were as many people in the yard as there had been when he stood in the same place and watched the mob rushing his client's guards. But today their temper was different, and as he paused a moment, looking down on the upturned, laughing faces with a hundred jocular and congratulatory salutations shouted up at him, somebody started a cheer, and it was taken up with thunderous goodwill. There followed the interrogation customary in such emergencies, and the anxious inquirer was informed by four or five hundred people simultaneously that Joe Loudon was all right. "'Head him off!' bellowed Mike Sheehan, suddenly darting up the steps. The shout increased, and with good reason, for he stepped quickly back within the doors, and retreating through the building made good his escape by a basement door. He struck off into a long detour, but though he managed to evade the crowd, he had to stop and shake hands with every third person he met. As he came out upon Main Street again, he encountered his father. "'Howdy do, Joe,' said this laconic person, and offered his hand. They shook briefly. "'Well,' he continued, rubbing his beard, "'how are you?' "'All right, father, I think.' "'Satisfied with the verdict?' I'd be pretty hard to please if I weren't, Joe laughed. Mr. Loudon rubbed his beard again. I was there, he said, without emotion. At the trial, you mean? Yes. He offered his hand once more, and again they shook. Well, come around and see us, he said. Thank you, I will. Well, said Mr. Loudon, good day, Joe. Good day, father. The young man stood looking after him with a curious smile. Then he gave a slight start. Far up the street he saw two figures, one a lady's in white, with a wide white hat, the other a man's, wearing recognizably clerical black. They seemed to be walking very slowly. It had been a day of triumph for Joe, but in all his life he never slept worse than he did that night. End of chapter 25。25 Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 26 Ancient of Days。He woke to the chiming of bells, 
and as his eyes slowly opened the sorrowful people of a dream who seemed to be bending over him weeping swam back into the darkness of the night whence they had come and returned to the imperceptible leaving their shadows in his heart slowly he rose stumbled into the outer room and released the fluttering shade but the sunshine springing like a golden lover through the open window only dazzled him and found no answering gladness to greet it nor joy in the royal day it heralded and yet to the newly cleaned boys on their way to midsummer morning sunday school the breath of that cool august day was as sweet as stolen apples no doubt the stir of far green thickets and the twinkle of silver slippered creeks shimmered in the longing vision of their minds eyes even so they were merry but joseph louden sighing as he descended his narrow stairs with the bitterness still upon his lips of the frightful coffee he had made heard the echo of their laughter with wonder it would be an hour at least before time to start to church when ariel expected him he stared absently up the street then down and after that began slowly to walk in the latter direction with no very active consciousness or care of where he went he had fallen into a profound reverie so deep that when he had crossed the bridge and turned into a dusty road which ran along the river bank he stopped mechanically beside the trunk of a fallen sycamore and lifting his head for the first time since he had set out looked about him with a melancholy perplexity a little surprised to find himself there for this was the spot where he had first seen the new ariel and on that fallen sycamore they had sat together remember across main street bridge at noon and joe's cheeks burned as he recalled why he had not understood the clear voice that had haunted him but that shame had fallen from him she had changed all that as she had changed so many things he sank down in the long grass with his back against the log and stared out over the fields of tall corn shaking in a steady wind all the way to the horizon changed so many things he said half aloud everything ah yes she had changed the whole world for joseph louden at his first sight of her and now it seemed to him that he was to lose her but not in the way he had thought almost from the very first he had the feeling that nothing so beautiful as that she should stay in canaan could happen to him he was sure that she was but for the little while that her coming was like the flying petals of which he had told her he had lain upon the earth and she had lifted him up for a moment he had felt the beatific wings enfolding him with gentle protection and then saw them lifted to bear the angel beyond his sight for it was incredible that the gods so loved joe louden that they would make greater gifts to him than this little time with her which they had granted him changed so many things the bars that had been between him and half of his world were down shattered never more to be replaced and the ban of canaan was lifted could this have been save for her and upon that thought he got to his feet uttering an exclamation of bitter self-reproach asking himself angrily what he was doing he knew how much she gave him what full measure of her affection was not that enough out upon you louden are you to sulk in your tent dower in the gloom or to play a man's part and if she be happy turn a cheery face upon her joy and thus this pilgrim recrossed the bridge emerging to the street with his head up smiling and his shoulders thrown back so that none might see the burden he carried ariel was waiting on the porch for him she wore the same dress she had worn that sunday of their tryst that exquisite dress with the faint lavender overtint like the tender colors of the beautiful day he had made his own she had not worn it since and he was far distant when he caught the first flickering glimpse of her through the lower branches of the maples but he remembered and again as on that day he heard a far-away ineffable music 
the elfland horns sounding the mysterious reveille which had wakened his soul to her coming she came to the gate to meet him and gave him her hand in greeting without a word or the need of one from either then together they set forth over the sun-flecked pavement the maples swishing above them heavier branches crooning in the strong breeze under a sky like a della robbia background and up against the glorious blue of it some laughing invisible god was blowing small rounded clouds of pure cotton as children blow thistledown when he opened her parasol as they came into the broad sunshine beyond upper main street there was the faintest mingling of wild roses and cinnamon loosed on the air joe she said i'm very happy that's right he returned heartily i think you always will be but oh i wish she went on that mr arp could have lived to see you come down the courthouse steps god bless him said joe i can hear the argument those dear old men have been so loyal to you joe no he returned loyal to eskew to you both she said i'm afraid the old circle is broken up they haven't met on the national house corner since he died the colonel told me he couldn't bear to go there again i don't believe any of them ever will he returned and yet i never pass the place that i don't see eskew in his old chair i went there last night to commune with him i couldn't sleep and i got up and went over there they had left the chairs out the town was asleep and it was beautiful moonlight to commune with him what about you why she asked plainly mystified i stood in need of good counsel he answered cheerfully or a friendly word perhaps and as i sat there after a while it came what was it to forget that i was sodden with selfishness to pretend not to be as full of meanness as i really was doesn't that seem to be eskew's own voice weren't you happy last night joe oh it was all right he said quickly don't you worry and at this old speech of his she broke into a little laugh of which he had no comprehension mamie came to see me early this morning she said after they had walked on in silence for a time everything is all right with her again that is i think it will be eugene is coming home and she added thoughtfully it will be best for him to have his old place on the tocsin again she showed me his letter and i liked it i think he's been through the fire joe's distorted smile appeared and has come out gold he asked no she laughed but nearer it and i think he'll try to be more worth her caring for she has always thought that his leaving the tocsin in the way he did was heroic that was her word for it and it was the finest thing he ever did i can't figure eugene out joe shook his head there's something behind his going away that i don't understand this was altogether the truth nor was there ever to come a time when either he or mamie would understand what things had determined the departure of eugene bantry though mamie never questioned as joe did the reasons for it or doubted those eugene had given her which were the same he had given her father for she was content with his return again the bells across the square rang out their chime the paths were decorously enlivened with family and neighborhood groups bound churchward and the rumble of the organ playing the people into their pews shook on the air and joe knew that he must speak quickly if he was to say what he had planned to say before he and ariel went into the church ariel he tried to compel his voice to a casual cheerfulness but it would do nothing for him except betray a desperate embarrassment she looked at him quickly and as quickly away yes i wanted to say something to you and i'd better do it now i think before i go to church for the first time in two years he managed to laugh though with some ruefulness and continued stammeringly i want to tell you how much i like him how much i admire him admire whom she asked a little coldly for she knew mr ladew so do i she answered looking straight ahead 
That's one reason why I wanted you to come with me today. It isn't only that. I want to tell you, to tell you, he broke off for a second. You remember that night in my office before fear came in? Yes, I remember. And that I, that something I said troubled you because it, it sounded as if I cared too much for you. No, not too much. She still looked straight ahead. They were walking very slowly. You didn't understand. You've been in my mind, you see, all those years. So much more than I and yours. I hadn't forgotten you, but to you I was really a stranger. No, no, he cried. Yes, I was, she said gently but very quickly. And I, I didn't want you to fall in love with me at first sight. And yet? Perhaps I did, but I hadn't thought of things in that way. I had just the same feeling for you that I always had, always. I had never cared so much for anyone else, and it seemed to me the most necessary thing in my life to come back to that old companionship. Don't you remember? It used to trouble you so when I would take your hand. I think I loved your being a little rough with me, and once when I saw how you had been hurt, that day you ran away, Ariel, he gasped helplessly. Have you forgotten? He gathered himself together with all his will. I want to prove to you, he said resolutely, that the dear kindness of you isn't thrown away on me. I want you to know what I began to say, that it's all right with me, and I think glad you... He stopped again. Ah, I've seen how much he cares for you. Have you? Ariel, he said, that isn't fair to me, if you trust me. You could not have helped seeing. But I've not seen it, she interrupted with great calmness. After having said this, she finished truthfully. If he did, I would never let him tell me. I like him too much. You mean you're not going to... Suddenly she turned to him. No, she said with a depth of anger he had not heard in her voice since that long ago winter day when she struck eugene bantry with her clenched fist she swept over him a blinding look of reproach how could i and there upon the steps of the church in the sudden dazzling vision of her love fell the burden of him who had made his sorrowful pilgrimage across main street bridge that morning a manifold rustling followed them as they went down the aisle, and the semblance of many whisperings. But Joe was not conscious of that as he took his place in Ariel's pew beside her. For him there was only the presence of divinity. The church was filled with it. They rose to sing. Ancient of days, who sitteth throned in glory, to thee all knees are bent, all voices pray. Thy love has blessed the wide world's wondrous story with light and light since Eden's dawning day. And then, as they knelt to pray, there were the white head of the three old friends of Eskew Arp, and beyond was the silver hair of Martin Pike, who knelt beside his daughter. Joe felt that people should be very kind to the judge. The sun, so eager without, came temperately through the windows, where stood angels and saints in gentle colors, and the face of the young minister in this quiet light was like the faces in the windows. Not only to confront your enemies, he said, that is not enough, nor is it that I would have you bluster at them, nor take arms against them. You will not have to do that if when they come at you you do not turn one inch aside but with an assured heart with good nature not noisily and with steadfastness you keep on your way if you can do that i say that they will turn aside for you and you shall walk straight through them and only laughter be left of their anger there was a stir among the people and many faces turned toward joe Two years ago he had sat in the same church, when his character and actions had furnished the underlying theme of a sermon, and he had recognized himself without difficulty. Today he had not the shadow of a dream that the same thing was happening. He thought the people were turning to look at Ariel, 
and he was very far from wondering at that. She saw that he did not understand. She was glad to have it so. She had taken off her gloves, and he was holding them lightly and reverently in his hands, looking down upon them, his thin cheeks a little flushed. And at that, and not knowing the glory that was in his soul, something forlorn in his careful tenderness toward her gloves so touched her that she felt the tears coming to her eyes with a sudden rush, and to prevent them. Not the empty gloves, Joe, she whispered. End of the Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington